Okay, I'm Lawrence Phipps, the third, and I was born October 28th, 1933, at St. Luke's Hospital in Denver. And then in 1937, when I was four, my father purchased Highlands Ranch. And I got to see it for the first time, and I remember my first view there. Oh, really? And what most impressed me was the white room, as we called it, with, right. yes. which, which is now everybody calls a solarium. Yes. And I can remember that as a four-year-old kid. Oh, boy. <laughs> so that's who I am. That's an impressive room. <laughs> and what has been your occupation? What occupations have you had? Uh, I, after I got out of college, I was in the Army, Army Intelligence for three years. And then I came to Denver and got a job with the Denver Equipment Company in sales. And I sold mining equipment. And uh, then after a year, I, I decided to go into business by myself. And I ended up doing some real estate deals. Uh, I went to a friend who was in real estate, very successful in Denver, told him I wanted to get my feet wet in real estate. He says, Lawrence, don't drown. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and I damn near did. <laughs> So that's my, my story. Uh, what was the mansion when you lived there? What was it like? Well, what, you came back from Wyoming after the war. It hadn't changed. My father made no changes in the mansion. Ah. Uh, he took it over from Kessler and uh, moved in some of his own furniture, inherited a lot of Kistler's furniture, the big white table and the white room, oh. for example, and uh, and the clock on the wall. Yes, oh yes. And when Kistler sold it, that clock was accepted from the contract. And oh. Kistler was supposed to come and get it. <laughs> And then our lawyers, when they saw it in my father's estate, they said that clock is personal property. Oh, yeah. and it has to be sold separate from the land. And, <laughs> and I, I had to take them back and show them how there's a fireplace behind that clock <laughs> and a four foot thick wall. Yeah, yes. And uh, <laughs> I guess, you know, with explosives and a backhoe, you could get that clock. But uh, well, yeah. But otherwise, it would sure be hard. Yes. And yeah. it was hard to explain to those lawyers that that was not personal property. Yes. Mark boundaries on the map or something. They want that. Okay. The windmills and the wells. You had quite a few wells on the ranch, I imagine. Right. And uh, being working with windmill crews is how I learned about windmills. Yeah. And when a windmill fails, you could you have two options. You can do what your instinct tells you to do, and that way. Time will give um, you chance to see whether the will learns anything or you learn anything. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so your instincts aren't always true. <laughs> <laughs> so the other way is. To, do it the way old windmill people do it. 
and uh, pull it, change the leathers, stick it back in the ground, examine the outer casing, examine the inner casing, and uh, replace what, climb up on the tower. And, dangerous uh, stuff. Yeah, dangerous stuff. Didn't you say the rattlesnakes liked the windmills? Oh, that was the rocks around the, the rock rocks base around of it. it. Okay. That rock enclosed windmill, the big one, yeah. up mm -hmm. on the hill, mm -hmm. was always full of rattlesnakes. Mm -hmm. And then there was a pump house uh, further south, east, where the big Douglas Aquifer well is, Aqu Arapo Aquifer well. Oh. And that's the one that supplied the ranch then. And, I think it's still in functioning. It had a little house, and that was always full of rattlesnakes. Oh. And it would often have uh, electrical disturbances. Oh, yeah. Spiders would build webs and trip circuit breakers. And oh, my gosh. And uh, they go in, you know, and it's, when it's bright, middle of summer and you walk into a dark a little shack with no windows that you can't see and everything rattling at you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, go, well. go in shooting. <laughs> <laughs> oh boy. That was a... Did you ever get bit by a snake? No. Yeah. Good. My mother um, like snakes, and taught me to be friends with snakes, and uh, especially bull snakes. Yes. And when I was riding, you know, as a kid, I'd pick them up and and shove their head up my sleeve, and let them wiggle. They, they go up and come out here, and then I shove them down here. And, the long ones, you know, I just ride home with oh my <laughs> tail God. sticking out and the head out. Crazy. And then I, uh, I had one snake, a pet snake, and he didn't like anybody else in the family. He'd hiss and try to bite him and snap at him. And, a bull snake. Yeah, but uh, I'd wrap him around my legs <laughs> when I go to sleep at night, you know. And, and in the morning, he'd still be there. Yeah. But I remember one day I was sick and I had the flu. And some neighbor lady came and my mother explained how I was sick. And she had to come look and so as soon as she did, I took the covers <laughs> off and <laughs> heard her go screaming out of there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was, that was fun. Oh, yes. Anything, stories about the barns around the big house at all? Or? Well, I spent a lot of time in those barns. Yes. Some had been built at the turn of the century. Others had been built um, before Phillips got there. And then others had been built. The big white barn, we called it, the milking barn, had been built by Kistler when he wanted to turn the place into a milk farm. Oh. And his answer to paying off his loans was to build that barn and get in dairy cows. But when he did, he found out that the Mountain Empire Dairyman's Association in those days was a closed club. Uh -huh. And he had nowhere to go with his milk. Oh, oh. <laughs> And uh, that's, what, that's what got Kistler. That's why he had to sell.
Mike, uh, what features do you remember about the mansion? Well, it was coal-fired, and in the wintertime, uh, we would go down, uh, the ranch hand, one of the winter jobs was to go down to the Woolhurst siding, take the grain trucks down there, and we would load the grain trucks off of a, a, a iron or a coal car. Uh, Mr. Phipps had a siding down there. He also, as I re recall, owned an interest in a coal mine, and that's where the coal came from. And we would uh, load the coal uh, at a little paddle-type elevator that we would push against the, the, the bottom of the coal car, and it would dump. And then we would bring the coal up here, and there's a, a furnace room in the bottom of the uh, adjacent to the garage over here. And we would dump that, uh, we'd empty that car, and sometimes two cars, into that uh, coal room. And then and the cowboys would take turns uh, manning the coal furnace in the wintertime. You had a, a week on and a week off, as I remember. If it got really cold, Mr. Phipps would call you in the middle of the night and say, you know, Mike, it's getting cold up here, and you'd have to get up and go put coal in the stoker to keep <laughs> the mansion warm. Um, and I would carry oxygen bottles up to uh, Mr. Phipps's mother-in-law. I don't remember her name, but she was uh, an invalid. Uh, that was other than the... One time I sat in the kitchen for several hours waiting to talk to Mr. Phipps. I remember that one. That was about the extent of my experience in the mansion. Now, Walter, were you were you around in the 65 flood? I, I was uh, not here, uh, but I we came up to visit. We were also affected down the east of Colorado Springs with the flood of 65 too. Washed out a lot of our fences, all the water gaps across the creeks had to be replaced. Some of the other fences had to be replaced. <laughs> Some of the cattle got mixed up with as resort them. But uh, up, up here it was on the, with the Platte River, it was along the farms, I guess it was a little more devastating. My brother would know more about that, but uh, we came up to visit afterwards to see the damage, but it was a while afterwards, later in the summer. But, uh, Skeet, what do you remember about the 65 flood? 65, it washed out everything. Bud Morgan used to live down on the Plum Creek, and Fred Hunter used to live on the Plum Creek. And his house, Bud Morgan's house, got totally wiped out. Fred Hunter had just a little bit of water in his house. But the debris worked the water away from it. We had to come in through after the water went down a little bit. The only way we get here is come down bowls and hit Happy Can uh, I forget the name of the street now. Down through and then come back across in order to get into Plum Creek, we had to doze our way in. But it wiped out so much fence and so much road and put a lot of rock and everything else in there. We had tractors, I think, down there on the Plum Creek. And one family had a, had a cow down there where the milking had chickens down there. And it, had the cow was inside the barn and she had to hold her head up above the water. We could hear the dagon roar of the river up here when it was going down the Plum Creek. What about any any interaction with the Cherokee Ranch? Mm -hmm. Mike? Yes. Um, we called that the Douglas Pasture that bordered the Cherokee. And that's where the heifers were kept. Um, and 
I remember we kept the, the, the replacement heifers down there and what, before the fall got, got too heavy, we would go gather them and bring them home, trail them all the way home from the Douglas pasture, which is on the west side of the, uh, Douglas Park. And an early mm. storm came in mm -hmm. and we had to go get them and it was, when we left here on horseback, it was 15 below zero. We rode across there. Uh, I remember being so incredibly cold and uncomfortable. And when we got over there, we built a fire because <laughs> we were all so miserable. And we gathered them up and trailed them back here. I remember that. And anyway, that bordered the Cherokee Ranch. Oh, yeah. I remember now. Yeah. You take a look at that place, look right straight up the hill from where the, down in the valley, look at the castle. You could look down at us. You could also look up and see Daniel's Park. You can also look down in to the ranch down there. Mike, there was an old barn mm -hmm. that was on the Douglas pasture that was interesting because it was made by a shipbuilder mm -hmm. and it was all no 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 metal in it. It was all made of wood peg. Uh, dowels and things like that. Very interesting look inside. I'm sure it's long gone, but it was a, a still, beautiful building. Still there. Is it? Mm -hmm. Still there? It is still there. Do you remember the silo? No, that's amazing. Wood silo, octagonal shape. Oh, yeah, yeah. Right, we had next, to, right next to it. <clears throat> go across, there was a bar on the south, on the west side of Santa Fe. And go across the bridge. I think in between the two bridges there's a gate we had to go through and wind up back up through there in order to get there. We had a spray. I think it took a sprayer up there once, once or twice back up in there and spray the cows. Yeah, that barn was built to last. And that was part of the wow. strip still, ranch too. Still, still there. And interestingly enough, the silo is built the same way as a ship. It's called a tongue lock silo. In Douglas County, there's only two of them. And one is still there. One is way down in the southern part of the county called the Roaring Ranch. It's the only two that I know of that are in Douglas County. So, Mike? Was the one you're talking about south of Castlewood Canyon? Yes, sir. I remember that one, too. Because yeah. I worked on the Prairie Canyon. Uh, after here, too. Yeah, the uh, Lorraine Ranch is sometimes called the Redgate Ranch. So, yeah, it's down that Lincoln Mountain and down in that area. First oral interview that we did was with Susanna Ray, granddaughter of L.C. Phipps II, one of the longest owner of the mansion. When do you recall that being? Uh, well, as I said, I was in the first graduating class, 1952, from the Plum Creek School. This is the one that still exists and is the bus administration for um, the Highlands Ranch, and we had uh, two outhouses on the property, one for the girls and one for the boys. Those were called two holers, and we had two large trees, and we could play stink, and we had two fences so you could run from one to the other called Pum Pum Pull Away, and the girls played hopscotch, and I don't know what the boys did, just whatever boys do, but the girls played hopscotch. Um, and we had recess, and we had to take all our galoshes. This is back in the days when you had snowsuits, the kind that you had to climb into. And if if you ever saw the uh, the one about what was the movie? And I'm I'm drawing a senior moment here, where they had the children all dressed up in the snowsuits, and you were walking like a 
Snow Zombie because you had these galoshes and snow. Christmas zombie. Story. Christmas Story. Thank the you. The in Cleveland. Yeah. Or the guy wanted the. The, the, the air rifle. Air rifle, the mm -hmm. Daisy air rifle. Remember that one? Yeah. And and that is a perfect example of what we had to dress up like when it was winter time. And we had a cloakroom, and we had to take off our galosh. I mean, it must have taken 15, 20 minutes to take off our galoshes. And, but we did have recess, and we had to go outside and I, to the outhouse. So I think we made it really fast. If we, it, I don't think we had to put on our galoshes. <laughs> I can't remember. Maybe we just tromped through the mud and snow. But the snow was usually like it is now. It can in this climate can snow four inches and by afternoon it's pretty much evaporated. So Another significant part of your life, in addition to your vet work, because it's all tied in together with your family, is the Arapahoe Hunt Club. Mm -hmm. Got any favorite stories you want to tell oh, from all your years at the Hunt Club? Oh, I have. Yes, I have. Eventually, you assumed leadership responsibilities, yeah. starting at the tender age of uh, 10, youngest right. whipper in. Right. And then your dad had been master of the, the hunt. Well, a huntsman. Huntsman. My dad was a huntsman. He yeah. was not a master. Mr. Phipps was a master. Mr. Phipps was the master. Uh -huh. yeah. when and then eventually Lawrence the third became the master. And successor. Right. Successor. And a little bit about the makeup of that. Then other people, W. W. Grant, Grant Jefferson's old law firm mm -hmm. was a master during the war when Mr. Phipps was gone. And then there was uh, there's been not a lot of people been mastered. I'm a master now as well as the huntsman. My dad was a professional huntsman. I'm an honorary huntsman because I don't, it's not my profession. I don't yeah. get any remuneration for that at all. Well, I get a lot of satisfaction out of it. Mm -hmm. Fact of the matter is, when we had our last hunt last Wednesday, and that's the end of my 72nd season, mm -hmm. either as a whipper in or as a huntsman. Cool. I've been a huntsman since 86, of what, that's 28 years. You're just about to wrap up the season. Yeah, we're done. we finished last you go Wednesday. Through May? Or you, no, we we <clears throat> you had your your Calcutta and banquet just it, last weekend. Yes, uh huh. Just a few uh -huh. days ago. Uh huh. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So anyway, the Arapaho Hunt Club. I have a wonderful, wonderful memories. I told you the one about chasing the coyote and not going back to school after that. So, mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, just time and time again, we we. Uh, things we would do, and I told you about the, the fellows and their horses here, from here. Uh, it it uh, was just all, my kids both got to ride, and my wife did too, and we had wonderful times hunting with with the, their children. And uh, the East Ranch, you know about the East Ranch, Wildcat Mountain here. Mm -hmm. My boy was six years old, and. He was riding, one, well, in fact, riding the horse that I rode on the first, my first roundup ride. Really a good horse. Here, this little six-year-old boy was riding his horse. He was 16 two hands high. Do you know what that means? Mm -hmm. And uh, I was riding a big horse, and we were over there, and he was riding with me. I galloped up on the hill, and I stopped, and his, he couldn't quite get his horse stopped. He ran in the back of mine, and he started to fall off over, over the horse's head, and I just reached out and got him by the belt. Pulled him back in the saddle, his cap was crooked, and he says, Daddy, damn it, don't stop so fast. <laughs> <laughs> really? <laughs> my dad, I was telling my dad about it as we were going up Wildcat Mountain about a half a mile later. He said, well, he said, you've been, you've been following me and giving me competition all, all your life. Now you got one right there. So the joy of that was there's three generations of us. So, right. Right and we have a picture of the... Of the towards the last season over here, just above the polo field over the hill. And there's a picture of my son as a whipper in and, my and me as a whipper in and my dad as a huntsman. Mm -hmm. We represented 90 years 
of all three of us of of scarlet coats and as either whipper is or huntsman. There is a there is a really good medical story I just happened to think about. My dad had a mare that he rode, and then my wife rode this horse, and the horse's name was Satin, and she was really a nice horse. And uh, she, it, as she got a little older, they bred her, and we were living here on the ranch, over right over here in this little cottage. One of the cottages. Uh huh. And the, when the her baby was due. Dad called me about oh eleven thirty, twelve o'clock at night, and he said, "Marvin, he says you've got to come quick." He said, "Satin's had the baby," and he says, "I'm pretty sure she's going to have another one." And so we got everybody up, our two children, and our little girl was just three years old, and our little boy was five, and they jumped in the truck, and we went over there. And when I got there, she had <clears throat> just had the second one. Well, the first one was pretty normal sized. He was all about that big. Mm -hmm. And the little filly was about that big. And she, the Those little. Those aren't that usual, are they? Oh, no. One in 10,000 yeah. survive. One in 10,000 sets survive. And uh, so this little thing, and, and my daughter, she loved her grandfather. Anyway, she, they, she wasn't strong enough to nurse. And so my father and my daughter, for three days, every three hours, which included during the night, got up and fed this little filly. that little filly. Well, on the fourth day, the little Dickens went to the pasture with her mother and her big brother. And uh, that, that, those two horses grew up, and unbeknownst to us, when that little filly was two years old and my daughter was five, she rode that little thing mm -hmm. by herself, and we didn't know that till our daughter told us when she was 18. Anyway, she went ahead and trained that little twin mm -hmm. and hunted her. I've got the sweetest picture of her and our daughter, daughter in pigtails, and hunted her. And uh, both of my children helped my dad with the hounds, as well as my wife and myself. Mm -hmm. So, and then the, the, more, the rest of that story is twins, it was questionable in those days if a, a female twin could have youngsters. Mm -hmm. Well, we bred that mare to a, a, one of the horses that Mr. Phipps had over there, and she had a horse named MLR, which was the best horse that was born and raised at the hunt club when, during my lifetime. Mm -hmm. He was just a marvelous horse. It wouldn't have happened without the, the yeah. nursing. Right. Yeah. Well, yeah. And, nice story. Uh, yeah, well, it's a, it's a, I use that, I use a picture of the good horse and the picture of my daughter riding the, his mother. And the, the horse that was such a good horse was probably, oh, 14, 15 inches taller than his mother. <laughs> yeah. yeah, good story. Yeah. Dr. Beam, do you have anything else you'd like uh, us to know about? Uh, the uh, the development of Highland Ranch was something that my father said, I hope they put the houses fairly close together so they don't have just patches of destroyed grass. He would be very pleased with what's mm -hmm. taken place with it. Yeah. And they left the back country, yeah. the best part. Yeah, oh. yeah, yeah. And uh, I feel extremely grateful and humbled to have the opportunity that I've had with, because of Mr. Phipps, and because of my family, and home to practice, and I've gotten to do the two things I like to do the best, and that's practice equine veterinary medicine and hunt the hounds. And you've developed a national reputation that's been mm -hmm. acknowledged. 
citizen yeah. of the year, <clears throat> volunteer of the year, whatever the Quarter Horse Association gave you, whatever, they gave you an award, didn't they? They did, yes. The uh, yeah. Masters of Fox Hunting, you were president of that from 2008 to 2011. Yeah. Lots of accolades yeah. have come your way. Well, so you must have done a few things right. Well, you know, I didn't mention one thing that I'd like to. And the, the person who kept us all going the right direction was my mother. Mm -hmm. she, I thought you were going to say your wife. You know, well, my wife tell has... Me about your, tell me about your mother's influence. Well, my mother, bless her heart, she, she hunted quite a little, but then she quit, but she always went out in the car. And she picked us all up. She picked. Were those called the hilltoppers? Yes. Yeah. And she knew where to go. She, she, mm -hmm. she'd say, "Okay, now we're going to go over here." And the reason I say I could listen to her because I, when I broke my leg once, I rode around with her, and I learned a lot about hunting that she knew from a different perspective. But and she. How did she know where to go? If oh, she just. The coyotes. Uh, she just knew. You're following. She'd them. watch the way the hounds would go, and she'd say, "Now well, you need to get over here, and here the yeah. coyote would go right by her car pretty yeah. soon." <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, but then her her really stabilizing job was when one of us had a wreck, she picked us all up. Yeah. She, <laughs> she was really, and she had she really stimulated me to go to college. It, uh, but it was a wonderful, wonderful of situation, and the the things that have happened to me, I just the title of my speech, as you heard me say a little earlier, this was "Do the little things well, the big things happen," and yeah. I tried to do that, um, and I did three things wrong when I got out of school. I came home to practice, and you weren't supposed to make that work. I had a pickup truck and everybody else had cars, <laughs> and I became a horse doctor. So. There you go. But it worked out okay. It sure did. Okay. Yeah. Well, I think we want to thank you for all of your comments and insights today. Well, it's been a revelation and a privilege to Thank you for putting it together. So, thank pleasure. you very much. But um, so anyway, um, we um, got all the things approved. But um, the day that we bought it, it was a memorable day. He said, "Now that we got it, we signed this thing with all the people: um, Davis et al., Mickey Miller. There's a bunch of them." And um, he said, "You go talk to Lamb, Governor Lamb." Yeah, Governor Lamb. And he was going to drive the nail through our project. Remember that? Mm -hmm. And uh, so anyway, then, and he said, now you go talk to the governor today. Tell him we bought the thing. And he said, send somebody down to the county and tell him we bought the ranch. So I sent Craig McCallum down. Mm -hmm. And he came back and he said, never do that to me again. <laughs> <laughs> just, he said, it was merciless down there. So anyway, we um, uh, went together. Phil and I went out to this is where the famous key is. We went out to the ranch and there was dirt, dirt road on county line. We were at the old steel gate. There were just cattle grazing all over and just was even oh, not quite as barren as that picture you have. And um, he said, Jim, it's all yours. And he hands me his car keys. He said, it's yours. I'll see you. Well, we got, I mean, he didn't drop me. I, mean, I, had, I got back in the car and he went, flew back to California. And I, so I spent the, uh, about, I think we spent three months, Callum and me, Callum and I, uh, doing a lot of trying to get, develop a staff and getting a place to have an office. And we started out up there at Arapaho and the freeway with a little dinky office. Then we moved down to Inverness and so forth. So um, that's how it all started. And uh, I mentioned to you, you were talking about our cook. I built up my staff from essentially people from California, Jack Coffee Company, and people that, you know, mm -hmm. mission people that would like to come over here, and it was a handful. And um, anyway, it was, uh, uh, it was a, a fantastic time.
We had just finished buying the ranch. Maybe you know this one better. And Universal Studios was to move in and start filming Centennial. Mm -hmm. I get the call from our attorneys. Fitz will let us on the ranch. I said, he what? He's at the gate with two mounted cowboys with guns. And he, I said, what's he want? I said, we have, that's, that's our ranch. Mm -hmm. He wants 10,000 bucks. I said, okay, all your equipment's on the street, right? All the big trucks, all, ready to move up here. And I said, tell him we'll pay him his 10,000 bucks. And, uh, and uh, but anyway, so he was very strange. I was giving a very uh, kind of important report to uh, the TV channels and the radio stations downstairs in the one room there. Mm -hmm. It was all full of all these important people. You know, so I'm giving the presentation and pretty soon my secretary, Barbara, comes in. And uh, Mr. Teffer, what is it, Barbara? Mr. Phipps has to see you. I said, well, I'm right in the middle of this presentation. He has to stop seeing you. I said, gentlemen, ladies, would you excuse me? So I went over to the doorway, and you, I'm sure everybody could hear him. I said, what is it, Lawrence? You're ruining my ranch. He said, what? You're ruining my ranch. You've got trucks running all over it. Well, I said, you know, it's not your ranch. We bought it for 23 million bucks. We're allowing you with a, a grant to graze cattle on it. And you're telling me that you think they're destroying your feed, right? Yes, I want them out of there. Well, that did it. I mean, that, I'm a very quiet guy, really. But I, I, I didn't express myself then, but after the meeting, and I said, Art, maybe I shouldn't say this. <laughs> Can you put a parenthesis around? <laughs> yes. Is that about anything? I'm not. I'm the, I'm the editor. Uh, okay, but don't. I, I, I'm telling you this just because it's, it's kind of a. Phipps had this bunch ride, you know, the uh, hound mm -hmm. thing. Rap a whole hunt. And, uh, and I just had it with Phipps, Lawrence. And Art had just been made a member of the ride. And I brought him in. I said, I've had it. Phipps is out of here. He said, but that's where they ride. <laughs> that's where we ride. I said, Art, it's done. I said, I can't put up with it. He doesn't own the ranch, we own the ranch, and we're gonna do anything we want with that thing. I mean, I mean that's in, within the law, naturally. And uh, so that, we terminated the Rappo hunt on the ranch here, and they went over to the east part of the state or something. That kind of brings you up to date a little bit about, uh, I think I did mention to you when I hired our cook, brought him, not hired him, but brought him over from California. And I needed somebody badly that I, you know, and I said, Art, come on over, you're gonna be in charge of community relations and you're going to be in charge of uh, uh, personnel and uh, office services. And uh, we'd been there about, a, he'd been over there about a week and I said, Art, where are the desks? I forgot it, Jim. He said, Jim, I don't like being in personnel and office services. What do you want to do? I just want to be out on the ranch. I said, okay, get out there and stay out there. Then he became our ranch manager and took care of all the ranching operations. And Because Phil would come over and, and talk with me, and how are things going? And naturally, everything was going beautifully. I didn't, I never, and uh, so we're sitting there talking. He said, I want to talk about ranch operations. Get Cook over here. So I got Art. And Art said, he says, Art, how are things going? He said, beautiful. Just made a sale. We did this, with this, with this, with this. And they're making money. And uh, uh, one of the things, uh, uh, Phil, that we did, we just bought a big cutter, a big new cutter. And it'll make our, when we create wheat or the haystacks, it makes them into the round, big round things. 
He said, well, that's great art, but those are big equipment and they're expensive. How do you get the big things where you want to care? Well, we bought a truck. I said, well, where did you get the money from the truck? And I'm sitting there sheepish, but <laughs> I don't know what he, and Art just kind of did his thing. He didn't do that afterwards, <laughs> but it was, uh, Art was, uh, and you must ask him that when you interview him. Did you have latitudes you weren't given to, you know, you, did you spend money you shouldn't have spent, Art? Did you? Not me. Uh, you know, it's, it's so funny the things we, during the dry season, we, um, I bought a, a water truck. So in case of fire, which were, you know, easy to catch fire on, on the prairie out there. And uh, we had a coal spell and then we had a fire. And they hauled the machine out there and it turned out it was all frozen. The whole thing. <laughs> so that, that's when we ended up going to a contract with Littleton Fire Department to get, get some good fire service. Thing. But how about your uh, buddy neighbors like Tweet Kimball? Uh, 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 by who? Tweet Kimball. Oh. <laughs> That's a story in itself. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's going to be a seven hour thing. <laughs> <laughs> Tweet Kimball was uh, the rancher to the north, south of us, uh, Cherokee Ranch. And I went down and met her, and, and I went up to the castle with Pat Farrell. You've heard this story? Probably. Mm -hmm. Oh. oh and um, knocked on her door, Barbara. F A R R E L L. One more time. F A R R E L L. And he was my manager for in the Aurora project, but very nice guy, very businesslike and good looking, and handsome. Went down there and made an appointment with her and went up to the castle and knocked on the door. And she, gracious, she said, Mr. Tepper, I said, Yes, Mr. Kimball. And she said, uh, Won't you come in? I said, Okay. And as she's got her back to me, she's walking to one of these little round coves, what do you call her? Mm -hmm. yeah, I know why you're here. So, well, why, Mrs. Kimmel? You want my vote? The planning commission. <laughs> I said, no. I said, I, I'm over here to just introduce myself because we're your neighbors now. You know, you're right there. Now, is there anything you want us to do? I said, you have the most beautiful things of red, red Angus I've ever seen. Mr. Tepfer, this is what you can do. They are not Red Angus, they're Senator Trudis. And the first thing you're going to do is fix your fence so they don't come over and impregnate all my cattle. And I said, okay, I said, well, I'll try to take care of that. So we talked for a long time, finally we went out to lunch. I, I feel embarrassed, to, but she's dead, okay. So I, <laughs> But she became the dearest friend. We'd have her to dinner. She'd only come to my house if I had lobster. You know, uh, but um, she, we went to lunch, and we went to Chateau Pyrenees. Oh, yeah. But it was closed. That, it was too late. So we went up to some place on Bellevue, and, and she drank wine. And boy, she did drink wine. And so we got in the car, and on the way back, I got one of these little vials that you know, with cinnamon or something. And she said, Jim, what is that? I'm on a gym basis now. I said, it's, it's, it's your breath thing. She said, could I have some? And I said, well, sure, here. And all the way from there, out to the castle down there. <laughs> and by the time we got to her place, she had taken it all. <laughs> but she became the dearest friend. And uh, I, I do want to tell you this one story because we, two stories with her because she was key. She was really uh, the big wheel kind of there in the planning commission, but they were all just wonderful people. But, and uh, we got invited out to an informal get together and Sue wore a sweater and a dress, a skirt and a sweater, and I wore like this. We get there and they're all in nice sport coats or suits. That was informal and I learned that Wisconsin informality is so different <laughs> in Colorado, you know. 
So we got to know, like I say, we got to know each other so well, and we'd invite her, Sue and I'd invite her to lunch or dinner, and we just got to know her there so well. Not, not for, you know, business-wise, we just were friends. Mm -hmm. So anyway, Princess Anne came from England. Have you heard this story? Do you want me to tell it? Yes. And um, so Princess Anne came, and they put on a big presentation up at one of the schools up in Denver, and then she had them out Saturday night. Uh, Princess Anne, her Lord Mayor of London, her entourage, ladies in waiting, the whole batch of them, and all the governors, maybe two governors around to look at, you know, and the, all the senators and everything else. And she um, isn't there yet, and everybody is mingling around. And have you been in the you know the place? You, and so it's a big room there, and all the people, the senators, was pretty clear, and. Uh, I look over and there are tweets going to me. I said, Sue said, tweet once. I said, okay. I went over and she said, Mr. Tepper, you're the only one I'm concerned about tonight. Uh, this is royalty. This is royalty and I don't want you to make an error. Now, if by some strange reason she comes and comes up to you, you curtsy, and Sue curtsies, and you take her hand and bow a little bit. And that's it, unless she starts a conversation, but just say it's so nice. And she said, now go back to where you were. <laughs> so, okay, so about 15 minutes later, Princess Anne has arrived with her entourage. And I said, uh oh, it was, you know, it was really exciting, you know. Princess Anne of England. And uh, so she's tried talking to her quite a while, 10, 15 minutes. Finally, she said, ladies and gentlemen, Princess Anne is now going to go around and meet you people and wish her the best. Okay, she's going to meet you now. And she heads right straight across that whole thing to me. Of all these 150, 200 people, she comes right over to Sue and me, not a <laughs> tweet <laughs> suggestion. And Fortunately, I could bow and Sue Kurt season. And, and Sue said later, she said, gee, Jim, she said, I, was, I couldn't say anything. I, what do you say to a princess? You know, they said, you just say, you know, tweet, oh, tweet and said before him, you don't say, how you doing, babe? You know, <laughs> but she was a kick. She's the only woman I ever saw that had her face pressed against the windshield to see as she drove. She was, I think she was blind. Well, one final comment for me, from watching the 400 pictures and reading your story and all. From the pictures in particular, it seemed like um, you guys knew how to throw good parties. That we did. Very family oriented. Yes, I was going to say they were family and oriented. And it looked like they had a good oh. time. We, they did, and the food was fantastic, even though the cook prepared it. And, uh, but I, I don't remember ever finding somebody drunk and laying on the ground or anything like that. Do you? It was free beer, that's what. Um, <laughs> those, pic those pictures, it's, you can tell it was a different time because the hairstyles oh, were okay. different. The shorts that even good. the guys wore were much Short. shorter than they are today, rather than these things that are halfway down your legs or whatever. And there was a lot of Miller light that seemed to show up in those pictures. Miller beer was part of the Philip Morris. <laughs> yeah, that's why there that's was a why, lot of Miller Lite that, yeah, but, uh, that seemed to show up in those pictures. I didn't get that beer, connection. Uh, um, became I a was, very good friend of the company. I, and, I was amused by the pictures of the kids with what appeared to be a holding on to the back legs of the pig. Oh, that was our, yeah, that was our, remember we had the grease, grease pig, pig contest. The grease pig contest. Yeah. The pig contest. Tell me about that. Well, we'd grease them up and then the kids would have to, Ketchup. And it Ketchup. wasn't just kids, wasn't it adults? And adults. Management well, they, too? We did both, I think. I, they, I, 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 I saw some management pictures, look like they were eyeing these now. pigs. I would like... lower myself. Oh, no, but you rode the tricycle, remember? <laughs> oh, oh, I lost. <laughs> right, out, right out here, by the way. It was all rigged. <laughs> Jack Rob rigged it. My he, bicycle didn't. Work. he didn't. Yes, he did. He rigged it. My, my bicycle wouldn't work. <laughs> <laughs> 
we we had a fun time. We did. We, we did. Are, so Donna, thank you for sharing all those oh, pictures. They gave me um, an insight of really what <laughs> sounds like you well, have I, an incredible company orient thank you. orientation. I, and obviously, we've lived and we live in this community now and um, benefit from the, the fruits of all of your collective efforts. Well, that's thank you. For and I wanted to percent. thank you on behalf of the Historical Society for spending a couple hours with us today and well, regaling us with some of the stories. In particular about your people that... <laughs> well, some Wait, things can't be helped. You <laughs> Don't you know you're loved? Uh, yeah. Don't you? Yeah, I know. Okay. Oh, yeah, I know. Okay, so I'm going to give you the final, the final word. I, I appreciate you giving me the time to talk, and I could keep talking, as you know, probably for another 7 or 12 hours. Yeah. <laughs> you know, there are, are so many things, the historical society, uh, what happened to the cheese ranch, and the problems we had with that, and, and uh, the groups that we thought we were building this underground city, and, and uh, I, I, it's so many funny things. You know, that you never would think would be a part of a, a development project, but uh, so many things affected so many of the residents, and, and the people enjoy living in these places. They enjoy a mission, and um, they're running out of money to want to expand the big pool at Mission. Oh. They need about a million four. Mm -hmm. So they're looking to you for that. <laughs> okay, well, we're going to have so to shut the door. Nice, uh, thank, thank you. Thank you. You're not too hard, and I got to walk home now. Yeah. <laughs>
and of course me as the turkey. <laughs> and we distributed, I think, was 35 turkeys to the new families that were living in Highlands Ranch, just as a welcome to them as the initial residents. Thank you, and we hope you're going to have a wonderful time.